All right, thank you everyone for the second talk of the track. And uh, for this talk, we have Tina, Tina Zhang Powell, and she is going to present us on um, the art of wrangling cats managing coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Tina, take it away. All right, good morning. Hello, uh, my name is Tina Zhang Pao, and I work for, oh, I gotta be closer. I work for the Microsoft uh, Security Response Center, which stands for MSRC. And uh, today, we're going to talk about um, coordinated vulner vulnerability disclosures. And I call it the art of wrangling cats because it's a, a hidden layer that people normally don't see. But at the same time, there's a lot of moving pieces that you have to keep track of. So we're kind of going to talk about two different stories on how we wrangled cats. And then at the same time, talk about you know what, what are some of the takeaways from it. So a little bit about me. I actually did not um, start in security or even technology related. Um, I went to school for art. Um, I, <laughs> I do scientific illustration and graphic design and a minor in art history. So completely unrelated to what I'm about to talk about. But one good thing that art school taught me was um, how to provide actionable feedback. You can't just say you like a piece of art. You have to say why you like that piece of art and actually provide you know, feedback where people can understand and use it in the future, right? So their art is more likable. So that's why I always want to tell people that it doesn't matter where you really start and it's really about where you want to go and what you actually like. So, that, oh wow. And then after that, I was a fashion photography for a while. Uh, worked in fashion cataloging. I know it sounds glorious, but it's really not as great as you think. It's a lot of long hours, a lot of traveling. Um, and then I worked in video games for a long time. And then after that, that's how I got into security after that because it was more about you hear people playing video games. Um, I was in a live ops and you realize a lot of people are hacking games, right? That's like a big thing um, to like, cheat your way to the top almost. But that's kind of how it sparked me to look into more security. Uh, how do we make the gaming world more fair, right? Like, you don't want to play a game where there's a lot of cheaters. So that's kind of my first step into security. And then I just kind of moved up from there. All right. So that's about me. And now let's talk about the CVD process. Very short agenda. Um, we're going to talk about CVD process because I want to make sure this is friendly to everyone, whether you're in the industry or not, or know um, what CVD actually is. And um, there will be two stories that uh, I actually have a lot of stories, but <laughs> I'm only picking two from the uh, past, past few years. And then we'll have some learnings and takeaways. And if there's time, we'll do Q&A. If not, you can always message me or come to me, uh, talk to me afterwards. All right. So CVD, which is Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure. And you hear this um, you know, when you talk to security researchers a lot and vendors. So what is it? Like why, and why do we do it? So CVD typically happens when a lot of um, research happens. And then afterwards, you want to talk about your research, right? You found this security vulnerability or this awesome bug um, in a software, and you want to talk about it. And through CVD, you can actually talk about it responsibly so it's actually fixed that everybody has patched, and then you can talk about it, which is, you know, the basic CVD process is you're a security researcher and you found a vulnerability, and then you report it to the vendor, and then the vendor fix vulnerability, and then provide a patch for it. And after that, you are allowed to go talk about it. You can talk about conference, it could be a blog, there's many different forms. And that way we make sure that everyone is actually protected from that vulnerability before we actually talk about them um, in public. And through all of this, there's a hidden layer, which is what I do, that you don't actually hear very often, which is the security technical program managers. So when you're working with larger companies and you report a vulnerability, it's not just about getting that vulnerability fixed by some developers that own the code. At the same time, there's people that are actually managing that whole process. Just because you reported that vulnerability, say, to Microsoft 
which you know my team uh, actually handles all the vulnerabilities for Microsoft, all of Microsoft products and services. So we, my team is actually only a team of about 30 people. And imagine 30 people is the gateway to all the vulnerabilities that affects Microsoft vulnerabilities. Um, so it's actually a big task, right? So there's a group of people that um, actually handle that process to make sure it's handled correctly. So, and within the MSRC, uh, we actually have a program called Microsoft uh, Vulnerability Research, the MSVR program. So in this program, we actually um, work with internal Microsoft researchers because just because Microsoft is a company that we intake our own vulnerabilities, we also have research teams that actually uh, look into other uh, vulnerabilities for other companies just just so that we can you know, improve the world all at the same time. So through the MSVR program, we're actually able to report some of these vulnerabilities out to the other companies out there. So um, the two examples that I'm going to talk about is actually reported through MSVR program. All right, the first one, um, this one is our RTOS vulnerability. And it actually has a name, so we all know when a vulnerability is bad enough or a group of uh, vulnerability bad enough, it gets a name. <laughs> this one's called Bad Outlook, which is a memory allo um, allocation vulnerability that actually affects a lot of um, IoT and OT devices. So when you go to a hospital, not everything, including you know your IV dripper, are IoT devices. So. Um, these vulnerabilities actually affect a lot of industry and, you know, medical, um, a lot of things that you don't imagine that have operating softwares in, but these vulnerabilities are within them. So for this one, there were um, 31 different, more than 31 actually, different um, RTOS systems that were affected. and. It was uh, 28 different companies, and we actually ended up with 25 CVEs total. And this was done in uh, 2020. So for this one, it's the sheer quantity. Imagine if you got this group of vulnerability, and then all of a sudden you realize it affects so many different actual RTOS and so many different companies, you're gonna have to start sort them out and report them out. And then at the same time, how do you make sure everyone fixes them within the same timeline and provide patches? So this one actually started um, in 2020 in August and by a team of the security researcher um, that actually based in Israel. And they're called, uh, it's, uh, they're, they're actually part of uh, Microsoft Defender for IoT. And they actually started as their own company and then Microsoft actually acquired them during this process while this was going. So in August 2020, when they found the vulnerabilities, uh, Microsoft haven't acquired them yet. So they actually contact CISA and NSA through the government because the government system has a system that will help you reach out, right? And then the system, you know, is not as robust as actually the Microsoft system. So what we do is after we acquired them, we actually push them through the MSVR program that we run through Microsoft. And then we actually were able to contact all the vendors that were affected and at the same time track all of them. We actually had to track all these companies around the world because it's not just one, you know, one base, uh, everybody comes to the US. No, this is actually more than 28 different companies around the world that we had to keep track of. And then we had constant meeting with CISA all the time. We had to pretty much keep all of this um, as a weekly to a monthly cadence update to everybody. And of course, um, at the end, this actually, this talk specific, uh, I mean, this uh, group of vulnerabilities specifically was actually presented at Black Hat uh, 20, um, in 2021. So if you're actually interested in the actual details of the technical aspect of what, of what it was, that would actually be a good talk for you to check out if you wanna learn that. Um, but yeah, so we actually, uh, this was a coordinated effort between the US government, CISA, and then the entire, all the 28 plus companies that we worked with that we actually came together and decided this is a timeline we want this fixed on and this is a day that we're disclosing on. And let's just say this disclosure day will move as a PM or program manager for the project, 
The date moved, I think, so much that I lost count. And there was a post-it note on my desk <laughs> that every time the day moved, I crossed it out and I rolled down a new one. Because when you're coordinating 28 different companies, n people are never going to be happy and never be on the same page. I think the original disclosure line was somewhere in February. <laughs> and then eventually, um, there was so much movement of so many different things because it's not just about having the patch, it's about the ability to actually push that patch out. Um, so some of the older, right, some of the older products is harder to get patched. So that was fun. So the whole process took, if you look at the timeline, took like eight months and including the researcher time, it's like a year-long process. That's why sometimes people are like, well, it's fixed, why can't I just talk about it? Well, it's fixed, but patching often takes a long time, which will lead to my next one, my next story. Um, well, okay, back it up. So major challenges for this one is the amount of people that we had to talk to and make sure that they don't accidentally disclose it on other people because we don't want people to zero day each other. So, um, and everyone had a different way of tracking their bugs. So how do you make sure that everyone is tracking them correctly? And we had the master list. And then have a good tracking system, obviously, and then pretty much talk about deadlines constantly, all the time. All right, the next story, this one is a group of Android vulnerabilities. So imagine when you buy a phone, say, from AT&T, there are apps that are installed default. You don't have a choice, right? Because you go with a specific telecom company and that's what you get. And there are vulnerabilities in those default programs that you don't have a choice on and you can't go update them either because they're not in the app store. So what happened here is the complexity of actually deploying a fix. So a group of vulnerability was found by the M365 Defender team. We got four CVEs from um, uh, uh, a vendor. I'm not gonna name people or talk about specifics because sometimes vendors request you that you don't name names because sometimes it's not the best publicity, right, when you talk about security vulnerabilities. So for this one, we actually, um, it impacted a lot of different major telecom companies that I'm not going to name. Uh, but the difficult part of this one, like if you look at the timeline, was fixed in September, we reported in September, fixed in November. That's like 60 days. Within 60 days it was fixed, and that's amazing, right? But we didn't disclose until four months later because it took so long to actually get everyone patched. So companies actually had to do mandatory updates, mandatory pushes to people's phone that restarts their phone, and nobody likes that. Nobody wanted to have their phone just automatically restarted, whether you're, you know, let it sitting overnight, or sometimes you're just, you don't even know when it happened. So some of the challenges for this one, obviously, is to actually have these fixes pushed out to the phones. And some of the older phones are just not as friendly when you try to force reset and force pushes. And of course, the major telecom companies never want to be named, right? That's not a good publicity. So the really main part for learning is give them the time to patch. We're doing a good thing here, and let's make sure we actually used our research and actually protect people before we talk about it. Yes, we wanna hear the story, but our number one goal here is always protect the customer and the users first, and then we can talk about it all we want. So, you know, be human and be understandable, like do and be understanding to the major companies and understand their difficulties and give them the time that they need so we can actually you know, meet our primary goal, which is actually protect our customers. And at the same time, it's almost always about, you know, how do we help, how do we coordinate this to, be, to, to work together so that this is a collaboration effort rather than we're trying to talk about a vulnerability for your product. All right, so really, if you like the stories, great, but the key takeaways here is really about building that relationship with the vendors and the companies and it doesn't matter who you're talking to, just be human so that they understand what you're trying to do and then people are a little more willing to work with you. And then I want, you know, the second part is the cat wranglers. We talk about, you know, 
the things that my team do that actually had to coordinate with all the people, well, make sure they don't zero day each other <laughs> and then make sure they all fix things and release things at the same time. And this is the layer that people don't see when we talk about security vulnerabilities. You always see it in the news that there's a vulnerability and then the company fixed it and then someone went public. But there's that layer of a whole team that managing that whole process to make sure it's actually, you know, disclosed responsibly. And that's where my team comes in, which is point number three here, is that we are hiring. So <laughs> um, the team is actually growing very rapidly. It started when I joined in 2018. We only had about 12 people, and then I think we're pushing uh, over 30 now. And, uh, and it's still growing. So um, if you're interested, feel free to come talk to me. And there's a Microsoft table out there that um, that there are people that you can talk to as well. So yeah, if there are any questions, I think I have two minutes <laughs> if anybody have questions. But yes. I have a quick one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, you know, what are the high and the lows for while working with the government? Um, you actually realize the, the, the government is actually really good at tracking all of these uh, vulnerabilities. So we actually relied on CISA to actually provide their official vulnerability list when we published the blog for the disclosure because they actually have that official list and they actually have that bigger hammer, right? You can't just say, oh, well, Microsoft found a vulnerability and we need you to fix it. And then some companies just like, well, Microsoft's not going to zero day us, so if we don't fix it, no one's going to know about it anyway. But CISA <laughs> has that hammer <laughs> that says you have to fix it, right? So that's the best part about working with CISA. And then the low part, honestly, this is purely uh, personal because they're in Washington, D.C., <laughs> they're East Coast, and I'm on the West Coast, and we had a lot of 6 a.m. meetings on my time, <laughs> and that was definitely the low point of this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> was the fact that I had to get up before, you know, six o'clock for all the normal meetings that was normal to them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyone else? But I think I'm on time. All right. And uh, if you have questions or just want to talk to me or just about what I do, what my team does in general, you can find me on LinkedIn or there's the uh, MSRC's website. So go check out there as well.